y'all. Hope you had a good first day here in Detroit. Uh, we're having a lot of fun here. Uh, we're going to probably, I'm probably not going to be too long. Um, but like you said, my name is Cole Kennedy. Uh, I'm the founder, CEO of Testify Sec. Um, uh, my co-founder over there, Mikhail, he, uh, he gave a talk earlier on Archivist. If you didn't see that, that'll be showing up a little bit in this, in this talk. So I encourage you to go back to the, the feed and, and go ahead and take a look at that. Might add some context. So at TestifySec, we're building a platform that enables enterprise to verify the integrity, compliance, and trustworthiness of their software. Um, and we're doing all this uh, with open source software with a thin layer of proprietary software on top. Uh, and really what the problem we see is that uh, ever since we started creating software, when we hand that software off to uh, production, right, there's really no way to tell what was in that software, where it came from, what was in it, what tools were used to build it, right? And so it's just a lot of magic. And uh, security and compliance uh, engineers and administrators are, are really struggling with this, especially with a lot of the new regulations that are coming out, right? You know. Um, there's a new NDAA that's uh, about to get um, signed in the law that says no software can have vulnerabilities, right? And there's an SSDF that's going to require you to certify all the steps of your supply chain and make attestations about that. Um, if you're a small company uh, that tries to sell software to the federal government, this is going to be really, really tough for you, right? It takes a lot of manual labor to produce these reports. And we're really trying to help these companies with this type of a burden through automation and, and attestation. So what I'm presenting on today is verifiable attestations uh, of eBPF traces, right? With witness, we can do a lot of different types of attestations. And, and this attester is uh, experimental. It's not in the main branch yet. Um, but why do we want to do it? One, we want to find hidden CVEs. If we look at the log4 shell or the heart bleed attack, um, those artifacts that were vulnerable to those attacks, there was no way to tell that they were vulnerable just by looking at the artifact itself. Um, later on, some tools did come out that kind of helped with this, let you kind of sift through the things. But when a CVE is just announced like these, what tools do you have as a security administrator to find out where you're affected in your inventory? Um, there was nothing. Now we have a little bit more. Uh, you know, we got S-bombs, and we have some other tools that can help out with this. But really, it, it's very difficult. Number two, we want to thwart malicious actors. Uh, SolarWinds had a really bad time. Um, I think we all remember what happened with them, right? Uh, their build system was completely compromised. Um, so they were shipping off signed artifacts that uh, their customers trusted that had malicious code inserted into it. And what happened was, their build system was compromised to the point where there was an agent running on their build system that every time a compiler kitchen action kicked off, um, it looked for a specific file and replaced it with its own version, therefore, therefore injecting that Trojan. Right? And there's really no way by looking at that artifact that you can tell that that happened. Right? If, uh, there is a paper, Reflections on Trust, Trusting Trust, uh, written a long time ago. Right? So we've known about this for a long time. We just haven't done anything until recently. And then finally, automated, uh, we want to automate pipeline compliance. Right? One of the biggest burdens we have is not necessarily that, making sure everything's secure, but making sure the people that care that it's secure have the information that they need to report up to uh, executives that say, hey, yeah, this is good. Or your customers, right? When a salesperson uh, is engaging with their customers, the first thing that a high compliance, high risk organization is going to do is ask you to make attestations about your software. And this is really tough to do if you're a small company just trying to ship features. Um, so at TestifySec, what we want to do is three things. We want to account for all the build materials, everything that goes into a build. We want to account for that. We want to account for all the build processes. If you do a static analysis test on your, on your pipeline, we want to have that information and be, let you deliver that to your customers, right? If you do a go build, right, we want to know which compiler you use to do that go build with. That way, if that compiler has a CVE that, that's going to compromise your entire organization, we can revoke privileges for that workload. And finally, right, we want to make sure that nothing was tampered with, like what happened in SolarWinds. We want to ensure that the build materials that 
we expect to go in the build actually do go into that build. So I'm gonna step back for a second. I'm gonna talk about Witness. Witness is our open source project. We started it about a year ago. Uh, the genesis was actually at, at KubeCon uh, NA last year. Uh, Mikhail and I have been working really, really hard on this and some software around it as well. What Witness does is it implements the Intoto specifications or parts of the Intoto specification. It allows software producer, producers to make and verify attestations about the software that they produce. It has integrations to projects, open source projects such as SigStore, Inspire, to allow you to sign these attestations without having to worry about keys. In addition, we do have a platform that we're developing that will also provide this capability. We have integrations into GitHub and GitLab currently. We have a GitHub action that's experimental that allows you to do this seamlessly. Uh, and we make it easy for, it makes it easy to produce verifiable evidence for software build. If, if you want to verify that that star off came from your, uh, some, from your static analysis tool, that's what Witness does. If you want to verify that the SBOM was produced at build time from the, uh, uh, the code in your repository, that's what Witness does, right? And, and finally, we support both containerized and non-containerized workloads. We understand that not every uh, software artifact is going to be delivered in a container. There is the vast majority of software, whether you're embedded or virtual machines, does not exist in a container. In the future, maybe it will, but today it doesn't. So what does it support? Well, what Witness does is allow you to make these attesters to pretty much do whatever you want. They're just little pieces of code that describe information about a system. Currently, we have attesters for, for GitHub. That's, there's a, currently a PR for that. GitLab, AWS, GCP, OpenSSF scorecard, uh, SBOM through the uh, Open S SPDX generator, um, SARF, OCI, so you can bind it to uh, actual container images, and then materials, what went into that um, build, product, what came out of that build, and then command run, how'd that build happen? And that command run is what we're gonna be focusing on today. So the other part of this equation is archivists, right? You have these attestations, you need somewhere to store them. Uh, Mikhail spoke about archivists earlier today at length, so I'm not gonna go in detail, but in general, it's an untrusted store. What do I mean by untrusted? Well, I mean that all the data in archivist is individually signed. So even if the database is completely 100% compromised, if you don't trust the certificate authority on that piece of data, you as a client are not required to trust it, right? Um, what it does, that indexes attestation into a graph database that allows you to follow, uh, um, that allows you to follow the uh, nodes and edges of your supply chain to find the evidence that you need. And then finally, it provides a GraphQL API into all this attestation data uh, to make querying very uh, efficient and flexible. So right now, in our release branch, we do include support for tracing within Witness. We currently use ptrace to collect traces. So if you enable your trace functionality doing a, while you're doing a Witness run, what happens is we attach a ptrace to, uh, to that process and collect all the, uh, the syscalls from that. Um, so that way, if when, uh, when that process goes out, that compiler process goes out to go touch a file or read a file, we know about that, so we stop that process, we hash that file, and record it. So we have, and then we allow that process to open it and read it, and, and the compiler can do what it wants with it. This is great, and it works really well. It's synchronous, that means we stop the process, we stop the world, and we record what's happening before we let it go on. But this also does have some downsides, right? Um, hashing takes time. When you add a ptrace to a process, that takes time. So it really does slow down builds um, quite significantly. Um, and, and there's also some other issues with uh, threading as well. Uh, actual impact in real CI systems, usually they're smaller machines in, in many cases, um, but sometimes it may double or even triple build times. So currently, experimentally, we, we have implemented EB, eBPF support in Witness using Tetragon. 
So what witness does is because it's actually executing your build process, we have that full context of what that build process is. So we know what the PID is, right? We know what, uh, what uh, and we also know what materials it should be touching, right? We add that context to it. So then we send that information to the Tetragon agent uh, with defined traces. So we say, okay, let's, let's trace everything that touches our working directory where our source code is. If anything changes in there, right, we'll know about it. Um, let's, if anything changes in there, we'll know about it, right? And so we're able to, um, we're able to record a, a very accurate bill of materials for everything that happened in addition to any network calls. So we're able to prove things like, hey, did this, does this CI process make a network call? Nope, it's, it's a hermetic build, we, we can say that. Um, did any of the files change while the build process were happening that we didn't expect it to? Nope, so it wasn't tampered with, right? But there are definitely some trade-offs between using BPF and Ptrace. Well, BPF, that's asynchronous, so what we're having to do with BPF is we get that gRPC call that says, okay, this file was touched, then we go hash it. Well, um, our compilation process has already read that in by the time we've hashed it, right? Um, with ptrace, right, that's synchronous, we get to stop the world and actually see what happens. So with BPF, we do miss some things. We do miss some file hash changes. Um, it is, in our testing, it's pretty accurate and we do get enough to determine if it was tampered or not. But again, as being asynchronous, it just has some, some trade-offs. Uh, BPF, it can monitor your entire system, right? With Ptrace, right, we're limited to only monitoring that build process. Um, but also, we don't require a root with Ptrace, right? We can run Ptrace traces in GitHub Actions on a shared runner. We can't do that with BPF, right? Because we require system-level access to install BPF. Um, with Ptrace, the coding part of it is a little bit tougher and more prone to error. Uh, with BPF, the abstractions that Tetragon has made have made it very, very easy to implement traces very, very quickly, um, depending on what your needs are. Uh, our current Ptrace implementation, we're not looking at any network calls. That, that's a future uh, addition that we're gonna make. Uh, our current implementation with BPF, right? we get all those network calls, we know exactly where your build process called out. So if your build process called it like called out to some malicious server, we can make some correlations with that and understand, okay, we shouldn't trust it because it, uh, ha it, it contacted hack, hackchinaserver.com, whatever, instead of uploading information or downloading information. Like I said before, the BPF agent, you need root on this, right? So it makes deployment much more difficult. If you're a small, medium enterprise and have a smaller security staff, you may not, have the ability to install a bunch of software all over your systems because you have to maintain that. With Ptrace, right, we just dash dash trace and it just works because we control that process that we're calling. Uh, BPF, that requires a modern kernel. And then Ptrace, right, we, we have compatibility. I looked it up, right, Unix v6 in 1976 is where that was introduced. So I don't think we have compatibility back that far, but Ptrace does. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do a demo. I got some code up on GitHub. You can go follow along if you want. Hit that QR code. All right. All right, so this demo is non-deterministic, so it may not go that well. We'll see. So the first thing we're gonna do, here I'll show you what this file looks like. Okay, so the first first thing we're gonna do, we're actually gonna attack solar burst type tampering, right? So uh, I recreated a, I, I built a red team tool, it's on our GitHub repository, that emulates a solar winds attack, but in a Linux environment and using Go. Uh, what we do is we're looking for any invocation of the Go binary, and when we see that Go binary, uh, we attach to it, 
and we look for it, call, it trying to open a file called main.go. If we see it open a file dot main.go, we, we inject some malicious code into it, we let the compiler uh, start back up again, and then once the compiler is done, we replace the original code back with it, so nobody knows, no, knows the difference. This is, this is very similar to how the, similar to how the solar winds attack. Um, so let's go to the demo. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually start Tetragon, and then we're gonna start our solar exploit um, tool, and then we're gonna run witness. Uh, so we're gonna name a step, we're gonna output an attestation, uh, watch prefix right here, this is for the BPF, right? This is, we're gonna watch all the files in, in, in our build folder. Um, Tetragon act address, that's a gRPC address for the Tetragon agent. Uh, right here, we are providing a key. Witness does support keyless. Um, so if you're running this in a build system, you do not need to provide a key. You can configure it to use uh, OIDC credentials. Um, and then we're going to just run our command. And we're gonna output a, a file called hacked. And then on step four, we're actually gonna show that at the station. And if everything goes right, you should see the hash is changing. All right. It needs root. All right, so now that exploit is running. It's looking for any invocation of, of Go. Here, I'm gonna send this to a different screen. All right, found the target. Now we're sending the um, stuff to Tetragon. We're setting the trace. You can see there, yeah. All right, you can see a bunch of stuff happened when I switched over the screen. So we have it in debug mode, so we're getting all like the different events that happen. Um, and you can see here that this exploit looks like it worked. So let's see. All right, so what we're looking for is file hashes, right? Do, do, do. All right, so you can see the file hash we started out with is, um, starts with a zero A, zero alpha. Go down, go down, go down. Oh, look at that, it changed. Process 238910 changed that file hash from zero alpha to a six nine, right? That's probably not good, that's our main.go. Nothing should change that file. So we know from this trace that this build has been tampered with. So we should probably do some alerting on that and do some mitigation. Right, and because witness includes a policy engine, you can actually do that with witness. You can write a Rego policy that evaluates this to make sure this type of stuff doesn't happen and, and it make sure this, this policy is applied to your build pipeline or integrate witness into something like an admission controller to make sure this stuff never really gets in your Kubernetes cluster. So let's go look at the policy. All right, well, time for demo two. Oh. All right, so here's another use case of this technology. Um, let's say your compiler was compromised, right? You had a malicious actor that changed your compiler, or it could just be a CVE that's really bad that makes anything compiled by that compiler um, vulnerable to a, a, a remote RCE, right? So what we wanna do is find everywhere, every single artifact in our system, every single workload that use this compiler. 
Now, it's really difficult to do this right now. You're most likely just going to have to rebuild all your software and redeploy it again. And if you're working anywhere that has legacy software, we know that this isn't always possible. All right. All right, so you can see we still have Tetragon running there. We're going to stop this, though. We don't need our exploit running anymore. Oh, I want to show you something, too. Just to show you it is, was actually hacked. Yeah, your code is hacked. So that's, that's what it injected in there. Um, all right, so let's look at this demo next. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is start Tetragon. We've already started Tetragon. Um, so then we're going to build with witness and then with the experimental BPF tracing. Then we're going to create a policy. I'll show you that policy. And we're going to sign that policy. One important thing about witness is different than a little, some of the other policy engines you may know about is that we require policies to actually be signed. That way not anyone can just put a policy in there, like a break glass policy, right? You would need to sign that break glass policy in order for that to be accepted. And number four, we're going to verify. Um, and we're going to make sure that um, that malicious compiler was not used in this build. In this case, yes, it was used in this build. So we should get a deny, poly a deny on this. All right. All right. We're setting those traces based upon the PID of this process. We get those debug messages. All right, so we're actually using our online public uh, version of Archivist here, so we stored it there. So hopefully the Wi-Fi works when we, when we do this verify. So we're going to sign that policy. Actually, let's go take a look at that policy real quick to you. I just want to show you what it looks like. So what we're doing is we, we have this attestation right here, this witness command run attestation. And then right here, we have actually no Rego policy in it. Uh-oh, I may have broke this demo. We'll see. All right. And we're going to verify it. Right, so this succeeded because we actually didn't have a policy on it. Let me, let me pull that code out of GitHub. I have it on old commit. I'm sorry about this. All right, so we'll take this Rego policy right here. That JSON looks right, doesn't it? Yeah. I think so. All right, so now we, we create a new unsigned policy. So let's go ahead and sign that. All right, cross your fingers. All right, and now that failed because we had that hash in there of that compiler we didn't want to use anymore. So now we've taken something that takes a lot of time. If you talk to anybody, but how long it took them to mitigate against something like Heartbleed or Log4j, right? If, if they have a policy engine like this and they have these attestations about their software, right, we can really lower that time. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so let me go back to my slide deck. That's it. And uh, does anyone have any questions? What are your questions? Yeah, so witness is just a binary that requires no root privileges at all. So what we did is we actually have a GitLab runner that we integrated with. Um, so it took 
pulled down the GitLab runner code, and I found the part where it creates a shell command that, that GitLab actually injects into that container. And we just instrumented that with witness. And it works great. So now, if you're using that GitLab runner, every single time you run a command, you, developers don't even need to worry about it, right? Just if they're using that GitLab runner, you're, you're creating some attestations, right? Um, for GitHub, we did something a little bit different. We're, it's, it's open source right now, but still experimental. So we have a Git, uh, we have a witness run action that, that uh, just takes some commands and then it'll run whatever's in there, right? And wrap it with witness. Jenkins, something similar. Uh, I think we're looking at maybe making a Jenkins share library or integrating with the agent for Jenkins, but that, that's probably gonna happen within the next couple of months or so. Yeah, so I am not the best at Rego, <laughs> um, but what, what you're doing is you're, you'd loop through all those SHA sums, right? And anything that's in your working directory is your code that shouldn't be changing, right? Shouldn't change. And so I'd create a loop that went over and verify that all those SHA sums didn't change. All right, any more questions? All right, if you do have any more questions, you think about anything else, I'm gonna be around all week until Friday. I'll be at a bunch of events. Uh, you see me in the hallways. Otherwise, hit me up on Twitter, DMs are open, LinkedIn, hit me up on messages there. Um, or you can hit a contact us on our website, testifysec.com. But we love open source, so if anyone wants to collaborate, got some use cases for us, we'd love to work with you. Hit us up on GitHub and let us know how we can improve this and make it work for your organization. Thank you.